department. Teaching at the University of Maine, partly the number of talks, including this one, and a very large in process uh, book. That insight was that since in the late 20th century, there was a very, very clear connection between alcohol and abuse, whether it was causal or not, I might profit by looking at the temperance movement, which, as you may know, was one of the major reform movements of the 19th century. Every bit as important, at least in size, and more important in terms of, of duration and numbers of participants as both the abolition movement and the women's rights movement. And in fact, of course, as you probably could suspect, many people were involved in all of, the, all of the movements at the same time. They moved from one movement to another. Much to my surprise, working with that initial investigative idea, I found so much material that I have been reading it for the last 20 years. And that very large in-process book promises to get larger and larger and maybe never finished. In fact, actually, just to give you an example, I mean, once you start looking for it, the material crops up everywhere. Again, I, start, I got into this thinking, I'm not going to find very much, because nobody had been working on it. And as soon as you start to look for it, it's sad to say, especially given the nature of the topic, domestic violence, as soon as you start to look for it, it's everywhere. And as the last evidence of this, some of you know, uh, on the way over here, we stopped off to see friends at Livermore, and the woman asked what I was talking about, so I told her, and she said, wait a minute, ran upstairs, got a book, and came down with this 1835 book of temperance essays. And again, this just popped, it fell into my hands uh, this afternoon. And here is a very, very brief excerpt from it. And I, I obviously haven't read the book. I just opened it, not quite at random, uh, but again, once you start looking for this material, the scary thing is it's everywhere. The following are some of the moral evils produced by intemperance. One, the temper is always sooner or later rendered peevish, fretful, and irascible. The least contradiction or the slightest inconvenience throws the habitual drunkard into a violent passion. He is continually disposed to quarrel and find fault with those around him, and especially with his nearest relations and best friends. His wife and children, it affords him peculiar pleasure to contradict, harass, perhaps even to beat. And then it goes on and on. Now this is not very descriptive of it. Lots more stuff is, is far more descriptive. But again, you start looking, and there's wife beating in, in many, many of the things that one, pick, one picks up. The, the temperance movement produced millions of copies of thousands and thousands of documents. And the documents, whether they're investigative reports, speeches, novels, stories, are absolutely full of domestic violence, especially wife beatings and murder. And indeed, I would say that violence and domestic violence was the dominant theme of the literature. It's, it's absolutely everywhere. What I found, and have already written, have written about at some length, is that 19th century Americans knew a great deal about wife abuse. It was not a societal problem swept under the rug and pushed up. 19th century Americans discussed openly the gory details of abuse, its onset in marriage, its repetitiveness, the implements husbands used. They discussed causes, consequences for society. They discussed possible solutions, fines, jail terms, whippings of white beaters, and of course, prohibition, which I'll talk about a little bit today. It was, in fact, not until early in the 20th century that this major social ill disappeared from social con consciousness, waiting much of the century until 1974 to be rediscovered with the publication of Erin Pizzi's alarming books, Scream Quietly or the Neighbors Will Hear You. I begin this specific topic of tonight's talk by way of the writings of an enormously popular and very, very funny late 19th century writer, Marietta Holly, who was born on a New York farm in 1836. Holly highlights the connection among temperance, wife abuse, prohibition, and, and women's rights. In 1877, just a few years after the appearance of her first comic exposition, of the wrongs done women, Frances Willard invited her to attend the WCTU meeting. The
The next year, Susan B. Anthony invited her to the National Women's Suffrage Association meetings. While Holly turned both down, she incorporated material they sent her in her books. Most of Holly's works deal with intemperance, abuse, and women's rights, but none in as much detail as her 1885 book, Sweet Sicily, or Josiah Allen as a Politician. All her books deal, somewhere along the line, they have Josiah Allen in, in, the, in the title. The books are essentially about Josiah Allen and his wife, Samantha. So sometimes you'll see books titled with Samantha. If you find them at flea markets, by the way, grab them up. I keep grabbing them up, and I keep getting duplicates because I don't remember which ones I've already gotten. <laughs> there are a lot of them, and there are many, many editions of them. Anyway, Sweet Sicily, 1885, is a catalog of women's oppression, of a mother losing her baby when her husband willed her away before birth, of a woman locked in an asylum, a wife whose husband used the money he collected when she broke her hip and he sued, you know, the store owner or the street, the, the, uh, uh, whoever had the sidewalk. He used the money he collected when she broke her hip to court another woman, all going to prove that women could slip out of the protective grasp of American <coughs> law only by dropping into the grave. When men about to build the Statue of Liberty asked Josiah Allen's wife, Samantha, whether Liberty was a woman, she replies, Liberty here in the United States was a man and might be depicted as setting his boot heel onto the respectful petition of 50,000 women. Sweet Sicily is also a thorough description of alcoholism, abuse, women's powerlessness, and their mutual aid, which develops themes Holly had raised in other books. If there is a commandment seemingly impossible to obey, she had written, it is for a woman to love a man she is in deadly fear of. It was for Holly that divine fellowship of suffering which had sent forth that wonderful woman's crusade, you know, the very popular crusade in which women carry nations sort of being a, a later version of it. Women would mark, go en masse to bars and sit down and pray or sometimes destroy them or uh, force the uh, liquor dealers to throw out their alcohol. Contemporaries rarely had to read further than a Holly dedication to know her sympathies. At first, she wrote, she was going to dedicate Josiah Allen's wife as a PA and PI to Josiah's children by his first wife. But she changed her mind when she realized they had friends and tongues of their own. Instead, it went, this is the dedication, instead it went to those who have no one to speak for them, to those who are in bonds, any kind of bonds, to those whose hearts ache through injustice and oppression, to those whose sad eyes look through tears for the dawning of a brighter, clearer day. Sweet Sicily is dedicated to the sad eyes, to the sad eyed mothers who, like Sicily, are looking across the cradle of their boys into the great world of temptation and danger. The temptation was clearly alcohol. The book begins with a warning. Sicily fell in love with a rich man she saw drunk twice before their marriage. She tried to unlove him, but could not. I would rather be beaten by his hand than crowned by another, she said, acknowledging early what was generally thought to be the almost inevitable fate of drunkards' wives. A liquor dealer, his friend, her husband's friend, refused Sicily's plea not to sell her husband liquor and taunted her that if she didn't like the law that allowed him a license, she should vote to change it. Sicily is apparently not beaten in the short time her marriage lasts. The twist in the story, though it is one that appears often in temperance literature, is that her husband, when drunk, murders a drunken friend. Then, early in the book, he dies in prison. That was the beginning of Sicily's awakening, which followed the path of so many women. She stayed home in stunted calm for several years until her child was four. Then she re-entered society, joined a temperance group, went into bars, and prayed. Her deceased husband's property, some of which Sicily had brought to the marriage, was managed by an executor who collected large rents for her from saloons. She learned that her property was taxed to keep the streets in front of those saloons smooth, that men who rented her house, not as intelligent as she, could vote. Sicily came to the conclusion 
that at least women ought to be able to vote on the temperance question. When women who are now in legal bondage were free to act as their heart and reason dictated, they who suffered most from intemperance would be the ones to strike the blow that would free the hand from the curse. In the book, one drunken husband whipped his wife in legal fashion. That is the law of the United States. Don't approve of a man whipping his wife enough to endanger her life. Then he ran away, got the property, and the two children. Another man, an industrious grocer, an indication that abuse was not seen exclusively in class terms, similarly followed the law, or what many people thought to be the law. In fact, they're wrong, but that's another chapter and another two-hour lecture, which we can't do. <laughs> followed the law in administering moderate correction. He whipped his wife, who having wanted two or three children, had nine, because she was cross. There was so much work to do with housework, milking cows, making butter, why I suppose she sometimes thought more of her own aching back than she did of the good of the government. Sometimes she got discouraged and was cross, but she had a deep reverence for the law and stood as whippings first rate. And not once in 17 years, despite the fact that she outweighed her husband by 80 pounds, not once did she whip him. <laughs> she died when her 12th child was born 13 months after the 11th. <laughs> there is other abuse and other oppression, and there is the callousness of the nation's political leaders to whom though these women go in their efforts to fight the whiskey ring. The ruling men fob off their visitors with nonsense about women being angels. Who ever heard of an angel being dragged off to a police court by a lot of men for fighting to defend her children and herself from a drunken husband that had broke her wings and blacked her eyes? Samantha thought men could see the injustice, but that customs and old ideas had hardened into habits of thought. The Bible, catch this one, the Bible, said one senator, taught man supremacy. When Samantha asked if he had read the Bible, he said he had seen it in his youth and had read parts, portions of Gulliver's travels as far as Lilliputians. <laughs> <laughs> There's a lot in Holly's books like that, so again, if you find them, buy them. You'll absolutely love them. She's often been compared to Mark Twain for reasons that seem fairly obvious. Holly's criticism of male government is devastating, and when combined with comments from some of her other books, thorough and full of suggestion for the connection between temperance and women's rights. In Josiah Allen on the Woman Question, published much later in 1914, she introduces another element of government and highlights another aspect of the temperance, prohibition, and women's rights campaign. Women, argued Josiah, were too interested in particulars. They wanted clean milk for babies, not recognizing the extra work involved in cleaning stables. They objected to garbage in the streets. They asked questions about the millions made in the white slave trade and the blood money from whiskey selling. They always have and always will pay more attention to them little particulars of right and wrong than men have time to. As I've said before, they can't see big, they see little, which helped to explain for Josiah a truly arrogant belief. Women found fault with the decision of the Supreme Court that poison could be used to bleach flour when they knew the Supreme Court is composed of the very smartest men in the nation. And they know them Supreme women didn't approve, Supreme men, sorry, didn't approve of using enough poison in it to kill the aged and infants. Even worse, they had to argue and boast that if they were Supreme women, they wouldn't have a mite of poison put into bread. Though Holly was not writing about prohibition legislation, more difficult to pass and enforce than it might have been because women lack power, she did suggest another barrier to the carrying out of women's wishes. Men were not empathetic and not prepared to see laws or constitutions in helpful ways. The need for supreme women, as opposed to supreme men, the need for supreme women was illustrated by the fight for prohibition laws and the fight over their constitutionality. The fight illustrated how prohibition fed the women's rights movement and how a slight shift in perspective 
altered views about government responsibility. How did one analyze the fight for prohibition and view the concept itself if the goal was not to limit men's freedom, but to protect women's lives? The battles pitted individuals against communities. In some ways, that was a male-female conflict. Certainly, while by the middle of the century, some women hoped that the individual rights philosophy would incorporate them, others understood that they were neither allowed to be individuals, nor given government support for support of communal values. The cruel trap women were in, as members of a community which sometimes had no rights, was another temperate source for the women's rights movement. It was bad enough that women had no immediate influence on legislation, but the failure of most states outside New England to pass prohibition laws, or of states to uniformly enforce those passed, along with the failure of some laws to withstand legislative and constitutional challenges, were object lessons to some women about their place in society. In popular terms, that place was illustrated by a newspaper story which reported that Sam Farmer kicked his wife around to prove that in this free country, only tyrants would deny people the liberty to buy and sell rum. Man's constitutional superiority in governments was largely accepted. What was not acceptable was that the Constitution was considered so thoroughly male by its interpreters that it jeopardized a woman's right to a life free of violence. Since some courts accepted the constitutionality of prohibition, women might well suspect that others would come around if women were part of the government. The debate over prohibition laws revolved around four points. Their effectiveness in ending drunkenness, their usefulness in ending social problems, their morality, and their constitutionality. Most critics argued that man's urge to drink was so great that, laws, that the laws, prohibition laws, could not be enforced. Men could simply not give up their desire to drink, regardless of laws. But even if they could be, even if they could be forced to stop, suppression of drinking would not be desirable because liquor was harmless, often useful, and sometimes necessary. For former Massachusetts Governor John Andrew, alcohol saved poor people from their infinite hopelessness. When misery robs one of hope and courage, D.O. Lewis wrote, people turn to anything promising mitigation, even at the cost of still greater misery. Intemperance, the opponents of prohibition agreed, was bad. But society would nonetheless be weakened by legislative prescriptions. The effort to resist overindulgence built character. Without some freedom and some temptation, there can be no moral discipline and no moral progress. People were not virtuous, argued D.O. Lewis, if they behaved only because they were watched and controlled. To prohibit alcohol, the Kansan argued, would violate God's plans since it eliminated free will. And this you'll like, I promise. Besides, prohibition was a terrible precedent. Next, people would ban opium and Sunday mail. <laughs> Perhaps more relevant to the problem of life torture, was the anti-prohibitionist attack on the causal association of drunkenness with societal problems. Since early in the 19th century, temperance reformers had blamed crime and, property, and poverty on alcohol. The opponents of prohibition reversed the order. Drunkenness and crime were the results of economic hardships. You can never make a wise and virtuous people out of a starving one, argued John Andrew. Interestingly, while the anti-prohibitionists specifically rejected a causal link running from drunkenness to poverty and crime, they rarely dealt with wife torture. Although several indicated 
that they would find acceptable laws allowing wives and children of intemperate men to sue those who sold them liquor. By the way, that's coming back in many states now, as you know. Uh, mostly, in any event, for the anti-prohibitionists, women were simply ignored. The general avoidance of the subject of life torture, which had come to be so important an element of the temperance argument, implied that prohibition's opponents had no counter-argument. Their attitude seems to have been that wife abuse existed, it was related to intemperance, but was not serious enough to warrant widespread government interference with the freedom of the individual. Members of a New York legislative committee who opposed the prohibition law agreed that those who drank too much inflicted irreparable injury on people entrusted to their guardianship, but forgot those wives and children when concluding that governments existed to protect the person's properties and rights of the governed as individuals. Dio Lewis even acknowledged the sad faces of the army of drunkards' wives. By and large, however, alcohol-related domestic violence was lost in almost unrecognizable, often trivialized descriptions. The crimes that can be said to be committed under the influence of intoxicating drinks are mostly assaults and batteries, not very numerous, and generally not very aggravated, Lewis wrote. And here women learned their constitutional place. Domestic assaults counted for little in the anti-prohibitionist value system. Evidence that prohibition protected families may have been moving, but it was ultimately meaningless. Rather than challenge the evidence, opponents of prohibition ignored it. To argue their case, critics often focused on specific provisions of prohibition bills. New York's Governor Horatio Seymour vetoed an 1854 bill in part because of the provision allowing officials to search people's homes. Governor John W. Dana vetoed an 1850 Maine bill because of a similar provision and because justices of the peace were given too much power. But details aside, the concept of prohibition itself was more objectionable. Dana objected, Dana being again the main governor in 1850, Dana objected to that whole system of legislation. Society, some argue, had no right to prohibit an act because it might lead to crime. Indeed, society had no rights at all. The duty of government, the only duty, wrote D.O. Lewis, was to protect the individual. And individuals, apparently men, had a right to abuse themselves regardless of the consequences for the defenseless for women. Opponents argued that prohibition laws were dangerous. Put forth to serve society and the public good, they were the entering wedge of despotism. The liberties of the people have been overthrown in many countries under color of promoting the public welfare, a critic of New York's proposed law wrote. Restraining one man because another might abuse a privilege was the cornerstone of despotism, John Andrew wrote, concluding that the universal pretext of every despotism is that liberty is dangerous to society. The principles often upheld, the very terms of the constitutional objections flaunted before women the conditions in which wife torture flourished. Personal and social freedom of necessity involved evils, the time argued in defense of Seymour, who vetoing the New York bill even said, sympathy to suffering wives and children must not lead us to create evils on the other extreme. Almost satirically, prohibition laws were denounced because they violated one particular sacred right, a man's right to privacy in his house. If there is one right which the individual has more uniformly claimed of his government and clung to with more tenacity than any other, it is that of regarding his home as inviolable, Governor Dana said. Ironically, despite Dana's veto, his remarks could have been used by anyone seeking to protect tortured wives, clearly illustrating how a slight shift in perspective might alter one's basic opinion 
of the value and constitutionality <coughs> of prohibition laws. Dana objected that the Prohibition Bill would expose the secrets of the family circle to the public gaze and the prying eye. Would a public good result from such an invasion of the sacred precincts of home, he asked. He asked. An essay in the Lily, which is a mid-century women's temperance newspaper, an essay in the Lily showed why many people would answer yes to Dana's question. Any of the far too numerous wives of tyrants could say, my home is so far a sanctuary that it conceals my suffering and my shame from the public eye, from the public sympathy also, which would act in my behalf. But too many people were, like Dana, bound by an interpretation of the Constitution and an acceptance of custom, custom which left men in unchallengeable positions behind locked doors. D.O. Lewis, more blatantly than anyone else, adopted an anti-prohibition stance which defended male prerogatives at the physical expense of women. A man had a legal right to make a glutton of himself and throw his wife and children on the town, Lewis wrote. Moreover, a man had no obligation to do more for his family than he can do consistently with his own personal freedom and his natural right to control his own property at his own discretion. If a government can say to a man who is doing his duty to his family as he sees his duty, that he was not so judicious as he might be, it would crush his pride, ambition, and affection. And any woman who looked to the government for support did not deserve her husband's love. In short, as Seymour had written, domestic relations are deemed sacred. The principle, home as man's cast castle, was inviolate the needs of suffering wives notwithstanding. Issues were clearly drawn. Prohibition supporters found their opponents' arguments self-serving, hypocritical, and cruel. Peleg Sprague attacked those who sought repeal of the Massachusetts law, allowing the sale of spirits only in 15-gallon quantities, as men of wealth. <laughs> Prohibition, except if you buy it in 15 gallon lots. <laughs> right, you're right. Pellet Sprague attacked those who saw repeal of the Massachusetts law allowing the sale of spirits only in 15 gallon quantities as men of wealth suddenly pleading for the rights of the poor they usually exploited. In addition, men were scolded for not taking seriously the wishes or even the existence of women, as when the New York Times defended Seymour. Our zealous reformers forget that in this country the consent of the governed is the only just basis of repressive and restrictive law. Opponents argued that prohibition was not popular among the people. But that was certainly not true, said Amasa Walker, if one would only think of women as people. <laughs> Accepted precedent established the morality and constitutionality of prohibition laws. Despite, despite the sweeping denials of the anti-prohibitionists, legislative infringements upon personal liberty were common. And they were accepted because civil society rested on a surrender of natural rights. The state could prohibit people from turning their homes into gambling <coughs> houses, force people to go to war, and shoot them if they were cowardly. The Massachusetts Temperance Society equated the state's right to ban prostitution and lotteries with the right to prevent drunkenness. A Massachusetts legislator supported an anti liquor bill of 1848 by reference to state action the previous year to suppress injurious publications. When the, where there was the difference, where was the difference between a law prohibiting the sale of alcohol and ones forbidding lotteries or the ban on obscene literature? Objecting to Governor Seymour's veto, the Tribune cited, the same New York Tribune we were talking about earlier, the Tribune cited state laws prohibiting liquor sales to slaves and a U.S. law prohibiting sales to Indians. <clears throat> the fate of numerous prohibition laws before the courts was a further education for people and stimulus for temperance women to demand the vote for more than securing the passage of legislation. A piece reprinted in the Lily made the relevant points. It described the liquor scene in an Indiana village after passage of a prohibition law. 
Citizens formed a league to maintain a constant war with the iniquitous traffic. The law was so successful, people began to become lethargic. <laughs> then the Supreme Court declared some provisions of the law unconstitutional. That's the state Supreme Court, that was. After which the sale of highly adulterated whiskey returned, and with it, revolting scenes of debauchery and drunken street fights. The lessons about pro preparation and vigilance were clear. So too was one about courts, judges, and decisions. In Indiana, the writer, the writer noted, Supreme Court judges were elected by a general vote. Temperance judges could be chosen, and they would understand that the evils that followed the law's rejection were prima facie evidence that such decisions were er erroneous perversions of true constitutional law. The writer understood that the court based its decision on the rights of property, and, the constitu and that constitutional interpretation emerged at least in part from a judge's background and the attractiveness of certain goals. Let the people elect learned judges of integrity and known temperance principles and see if such expounders will not pr pronounce the present law constitutional. In fact, in part because of the differences in state constitutions, in part because of judicial differences, opinions about prohibition laws varied and were handed down by divided courts. Massachusetts Supreme Court relied on the due process clause of the Constitution to strike down the search and seizure provision. Michigan's court, Supreme Court, in effect, did away with the state law by a 4-4 split. The Indiana decision was written by a recently elected anti-Main law Democrat whose opinion about the absolute property rights and liquor did not coincide with rulings of the U.S. Supreme Court. New York's prohibition law failed to survive court challenge. On the other hand, Connecticut's court upheld the prohibition law, though its state constitution had a similar provision regarding property rights as Massachusetts. Vermont's constitution did not guarantee property rights, so its court validated prohibition. Kansas's law of the 1880s survived numerous challenges, and in 1887, the US Supreme Court found Kansas's regulations a legitimate way to protect the community against the evils of excessive drinking. The prohibition fight was an ongoing struggle for the passage of legislation, its protection after each election, for enforcement, and for constitutional validity. To a significant extent, arguing for these laws, prohibitionists based their case on women's desperate need for protection, and they directly challenged the legitimacy of domestic secrecy. Unquestionably, prohibitionists were meddlers in family life who rejected the idea that a law which interfered with, man's, with a man's domestic affairs was wicked, unjust, and tyrannical. Behind locked doors, the American Temperance Union noted in 1839, a tyrant forges chains of oppression for his subjects. Perish man, perish domestic peace, John Marsh wrote, following a New York court rejection of a prohibition law. Follow the drunk at home, Angelina Fish noted after Seymour's veto, witness his brutal violence and the terror of his wife. In the debate over the legitimacy of prohibition laws, supporters saw no need to prove domestic brutality. We know all this, Emery Washburn quotes opponents as saying. You will gain nothing from us by such appeals. Instead, building on the admitted social problem, the prohibitionists assigned blame, placing on alcohol's defenders responsibility for every bitter, scalding tear shed by a woman for a husband's unkindness. Marsh, for example, asked the head of the New York bar whether existing domestic sorrow was not evidence enough that his victorious fight against prohibition was too dearly bought. Opponents understood the problem and offered no help. Although most prohibitionists did not advocate sweeping changes to help women, they refused to believe that society had no interest in the matter or that it was helpless. 
Is it nothing to society that the hopes and energies of wives were crushed by husbands who were brutes? Can the law not see to it that you do not beat and abuse your wife? As one prohibitionist argued, can the state tax childless people for public education because ignorance is a curse and not have the right also to restrain the dram shop next door from where my neighbor goes home to bury his hatchet in the head of his wife? As these prohibitionists analyzed the problem, their opponents were stuck with too narrow a view of what was constitutional and too one-sided an idea of liberty. According to the American Temperance Union, zealots for liberty who attacked prohibition in Tennessee were really arguing that men must have liberty to make their wives slaves to disappointment, abuse, despair, and death. Prohibition interfere with personal liberty? Nay, nay, the speaker told the National Temperance Convention in 1875. It was not prohibition which destroyed liberty and not men who were unfree. Alcohol menaces liberty of education and deprives children and wives of the liberty to enjoy the blessings of home. The point was well made in the song Rum, a song for the rights of man. The day of his triumph has come and women and children have no rights in this glorious age of rum. The freedom of men to drink and their right to enjoy private property were not always to be paramount. As the 34,000 women who petitioned the Massachusetts legislature in 1838 explained, woman has rights as well as man. In another petition, remonstrance referred to a law written upon the heart. Marsh made that unseen law a part of the Constitution. He rejected the idea that property is sacred and complained that in matters of constitutional law, the cries of humanity were not regarded. He played on the laments and appeals of the suffering to argue that protection from evil was as much the constitutional right of the people as protection of property. We suppose the Lilly commented after an Ohio law was ruled unconstitutional that it is perfectly constitutional for men to get drunk, whip, beat, and murder their wives. Most male prohibitionists adopted a single and simple approach to domestic brutality. Assuming alcohol was the major factor, they worked tirelessly for prohibition. Failing to achieve prohibition, most were at a loss for ways to help women. Like the opponents of prohibition, they were caught in a mental trap. Lucian Minor passionately described the plight of a drunken man's wife. He included the oft-repeated comment that liquor dealers should be paid with inscribed coin. It's coins inscribed with the following statement. This certifies that the bearer has made a man beat his wife. Minor implied that without prohibition, society and wives would be helpless. Emory Washburn was more blunt. The law has chained the destiny of the wife to that of her husband by bonds that death alone can sever. Close as they were to seeing the whole problem, neither Minor nor Washburn suggested breaking the chains which made women slaves to husbands drunk or sober. Women's rights advocates, many of them emerging from the temperance movement, understood that the prohibition fight could not legit legitimately be considered to be about the rights of individuals, not when women who all agreed suffered most from the liquor traffic entered the fight without rights. From their perspective, it was a fight between the rights of men and women. Men to do what they wanted, and women to claim some benefit from the idea of home and community. What some women learned, some very quickly, was that the attempt to secure for the drunkard's wife a life free of brutality, free of the fear of murder, involved far more than temperance or prohibition. Failing to win the community's protection, it involved gaining the power to protect oneself. As early as 1853, at a temperance society meeting, Elizabeth Cady Stanton had pointed the way. If she asked, in discussing the legal disabilities of the drunkard's wife, if in showing her wrongs, we prove the right of all womankind to the elective franchise, to the right in criminal cases to be tried by peers of her own choosing, shall it be said that we transcended, transcended the bounds of our subject? Who shall say, she added, 
that the discussion of this question does not lead us legitimately into the consideration of divorce. Like some others, Stanton would emphasize the right of a drunken's wife to divorce, to keep her children, and to work at, a, at decent wages. In short, to protect a drunken's wife meant ultimately to alter the laws of marriage, and that meant real revolution. That's it. <laughs> My response is that it's, it's, it's almost terrifying to, uh, uh, to, to, uh, to realize that we haven't come very far. <laughs> Chapter two. <laughs> it, actually, the, the thing I have to tell you, I, I hinted at that, but I didn't have time to go into it. The thing that really, you're right, it's absolutely terrifying. It terrified me the most. Uh, again, when, when I started to do this, it was 1980, I think it was sometime around. And there really wasn't much, I mean, there was stuff about the 20th century, it was beginning, late 20th century, contemporary times, that was beginning to come out. Not much about the 19th century, and I, didn't, I really, really didn't have much hopes of finding a lot of stuff, because, you know, you, even though I taught history for Lord knows how long, and I resist the temptation, you really do sort of inevitably think that there's a kind of steady, gradual incline in progress or something. So it never occurred to me that what I was going to find was all this material. And it's not that, it's not only that we haven't come far enough or very far in dealing with life abuse, we haven't advanced very far over what they knew. The, the really tragic thing is that they knew all this and we forgot it. They forgot it. I mean, really, it, it just, this stuff comes crashing to a halt, publicity about it, sometime early in the 20th century. And you, you could, you could uh, stand, do you have any news, do you, uh, does the Historical Society oh, yeah, have newspapers? Lots of newspapers. Lots of I suspect you could spend an afternoon just go through the newspapers and look at the police reports. And the police reports will be full of information about people arrested for beating their wives. I mean, it's, it's all there. I mean, it's just full of it. And they stop, you know, they stop printing that type of stuff. In, for, I mean, there are a lot of reasons for it, but by the early 20th century, actually, w one of the things that's interesting is uh, they partly they stop publishing some of this information in the newspapers, because they think that they, they're trying to avoid lawsuits and, and uh, protect people's right, rights. In the 19th century, they would say so-and-so was arrested for beating his wife. In the 20th century, that would have had to have been changed into allegedly beating his wife. You know, but I mean, they already had the guy convicted as soon as they arrested him in, in the 19th century. So the, the publicity just dies. So the, the really tragic thing, I mean, the, the story is tragic on, on many levels, we haven't come far enough in dealing with the problem, and we haven't advanced very far in, in over what they knew. I mean, it's amazing the stuff they knew. It's, and again, it's all over. You start looking at, at novels you had read as a child, and all of a sudden you say, I don't remember that. I, the one that absolutely blew up my wife and uh, me away, we had, everybody in the world has read The Secret Garden. Yeah. Francis, Francis, Hodgson. Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 I mean, how many times you read it to yourself, you read it to your children, you go over and over again. Towards the end of the book, I don't know, we were rereading it at one point, uh, on the tomb, we were rereading it, and all of a sudden they're talking about Ben the gardener. Oh, yeah, that's Ben. He goes home and he beats his wife. And I mean, we've been reading this all along and absolutely <laughs> never saw it. Never saw it. Mm. I just. Whoosh, my pants. I'm not sure. But once you start looking, one of the things that after I started on this, I, you know, we spent a lot of time running around in flea markets and antique shows, and you can pick up school readers from the 1830s and the 1840s, and you'll find wife abuse stuff in, in the school reader. Amazing. Amazing. Well, a great example of that is even the reception that, uh, that, uh, that uh, Peyton Place received. And that had been redone recently, and uh, I taught it to a group of kids, high school kids, in the literature class. They were dumbfounded, <laughs> but it really impressed them, yeah. and, and impressed me to, to, the ascent, to, to the extent of how, how detailed and, and, and how complex and sophisticated yeah. the descriptions of various forms of abuse sure. was. 
Yeah. Uh, now, one prohibition did get accepted. It didn't last long. No. Uh, now, the reason for it, if it had to do with light beating, all of a sudden the answer was, well, we can't control it. Was that the well, I mean, society the wouldn't accept it? Would you mean national prohibition? Uh, national prohibition, most scholars are now saying, has had a very bad rap, that it actually was quite effective. I mean, but that effort was hugely unpopular. Now, I do want to point out that the issue has changed. By the time you get to prohibition, uh, there, there's not, I mean, this whole claim and what I'm talking about is women, women have essentially no rights. I mean, they're, they're not quite as bad, badly off as Marietta Holly says in outlining all the terrible things that happen to women. But essentially, they have very little in the way of rights, and they certainly can't vote. Men are hauling out all these constitutional arguments saying, you know, you can't interfere with our, uh, our liberty. And women, women simply, they have nothing. They have nothing to fight them with. By the time you get to national prohibition and shortly thereafter, women get the suffrage. So in a sense, men can now say, you have other ways to protect yourselves. You have, you have and that's one of the reasons why the publicity about uh, all this disappears. When women are without rights, there is a certain kind of uh, patriarchal and paternalistic attitude. We have to take care of them because they don't have any rights. And taking care of them may mean our giving up alcohol, or may mean our working and you have to give up alcohol. Once women get the right, the right to vote, even though women never argue this way, men say, OK, you've gotten the right to vote. You know, in, the, in 1999 or 2000, they would say, you want equality? I don't have to open the door for you anymore. All right? You have the right to vote. You don't deserve special treatment. So you have, you have other ways of protecting yourself. We don't have to worry about prohibition. You don't like it, get out. Well, of course, they don't have the right to go to work and you don't earn all that money and stuff. But the, the myth is, we've given you the right to vote. Stop bothering us. <laughs> On the other hand, uh, women start the, the uh, national morals change, and women start drinking too in the uh, in the twenties, the roaring yeah. twenties, and all that. I mean, the drinks over the too. Whole, yeah, yeah, there's a whole change in society right. that accepts that. Yeah. They're, they're drinking. Here, they're drinking here too. You know. Yeah, sure. of course, they were drinking uh, cat and medicine. Well, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Other comments? Questions? Thank you very much, Jerry. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.